All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning and we just want to thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. And Lord, we just ask that you'd help us, Father, to be faithful to you this morning. Fill us with your spirit. Give us words to speak, Lord. Again, we just want to thank you. Help us to be faithful. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, I want to greet you all this morning in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I was just encouraged this morning and blessed with the, the songs. Uh, one of, all, all glory, laud, and honor. We sang about this morning about thankfulness to the Lord. Uh, and then the boys' lesson and how the Bible talked about His mercy endures forever. And just a few thoughts. Uh, probably one of the things that is is uh, uh, one, of, one of the biggest enemies we have in following the Lord is is discouragement or a lack of faith. Jesus talked about a lack of faith in a lot of people and discouragement. You know, whenever you're watching people sports, we've seen sports teams and one of the jobs of the coach is to keep the team encouraged. They have people that lead cheers, cheerleaders, that their purpose is to tell the team, go on, you can do it. The crowd is encouraged. They, they get behind the team so that the team will really be encouraged. Not necessarily that they would perform because the performance is a result of being encouraged, not necessarily the other way around. You know, you hardly ever see a team that performs that is discouraged. It just doesn't. I mean, if you're discouraged, you just don't even want to be involved. You don't want to play. You just want to. You just want to mope around. You can never perform the way you're supposed to by being discouraged. We see that in teams. Oftentimes teams have lost because they've given up. They've lost hope. They just threw up their hands and said, what the, what's the use? We're going to lose anyway. What would you say to a coach that, that said, oh, you all are worthless. You're going to lose anyway. Just, you just, well, go play. It ain't going to matter. You're going to lose. What would you think of a coach that told people like that? Yeah, there's no hope. Just forget it. Go play out there. Just, you know, hope you don't get hurt. But you're going to lose anyway. It, it would be ridiculous. The purpose of the coach, one of his biggest challenges is to say, you have it in you to do this. Be encouraged. And the songs that we sang this morning about praising the Lord. You know, if we look at ourselves and we, we just examine ourselves continually because we're concerned about our performance, we usually wind up getting discouraged. If we just look at ourselves and we just continually watch ourselves, the result of that is going to be one, one of two things. We're either going to get proud and we think, wow, we're really doing good. Or we get discouraged. 
the boys talked about the difference between the Pharisees and a righteous man. A Pharisee sees what he does and he's encouraged within himself. He finds his courage in himself because of his performance. And a righteous man oftentimes makes the fatal mistake of looking at himself and seeing all of his errors. And what's he do? He's, he becomes just like that coach that's saying, well, go on out there, but you know, you can try, but you're just going to fail. Because we're looking at ourselves, we know ourselves. But a true righteous man doesn't find his encouragement in his performance. A true righteous man finds his courage in the Lord. And that's where we fall short so many times. We, we begin to think, we think sometimes because we're doing a few right things, we're trying to follow the Bible, we can look at all of the examples all around us of people who just disregard what the Bible says, that just pay no attention at all to even trying to do what's right. In fact, they're taught that if you try to do what's right, then you're just displeasing to God. You're confusing grace. That you're just trying to make a mess of it. There's nothing good in you. You're discouraged from even trying to do what's right, from trying to obey the Lord. That's what we hear. That's what's all around us. Because we're saved by grace or saved by faith. And so all we do is pretend that we're going to be saved and it'll be all right. And so we, trying to believe what the Lord says, try to put it into practice, we, we have a tendency of, to do a couple of different things. One of them is to get proud of ourselves and just start thinking that we're doing real good. And another is, is to try to, as hard as we try, we see our failures and we get discouraged. But a true righteous man has his faith in the Lord. And his faith and his hope is not in his own performance, but his willingness to do the Lord's will. And he finds his courage in the Lord. Because it's not the man's mercy that endures forever. It's the Lord's mercy that endures forever. That's why there's so many verses and so many passages in the Bible that says that the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Trust in the Lord. And what I want to try to encourage us this morning is to take more time. To take time in your life and just encourage yourself, not in you, but encourage yourself in the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be encouraged because He is good and He is worthy to be saved or to be praised. He is worthy. And that's what makes us who we are. Without Him, we are nothing. And oftentimes we try too hard just to do it ourselves. We, we teach that. We teach that you are responsible for your actions. But if you're only you, that's all it goes. That's as far as it goes. We're responsible. We love the Lord because He loves us. We please the Lord because that's what He wants from us. And we can still find our courage and our strength from Him. We have the choice to, to right and wrong. It's, it's our choice. 
But the power to save ourselves is not with us. It's being connected to Him. Just like the power in the wall. There's all kinds of electricity. But until we're plugged into it, or until the machine or the light or whatever it is is plugged into it, it's just sitting there dead. But when it gets a hold of the what's really there, the power, then it has power. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Verse 9. The Pharisee and the publican. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. You know, one time, probably one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. I was at a Mennonite church. I was going to a Mennonite church there. And I stepped out the door and there was a bunch of young men sitting on the front porch. And this brown car pulled in. And if you know anything about Mennonites, these Mennonites all drove black cars. Everybody had a shiny black car. It was just part of the rules. And this brown car pulled in. And I heard one of the boys say, what are they doing here? Didn't know who they were. Didn't know a thing about them. But one of the boys just said, what are they doing here? They're not one of us. They're not us. They didn't have to say they were driving a brown car, but that made them, that made the distinction that showed them what are they doing here? Probably the most contemptuous thing I've ever heard in my life. But how many times, how many times do we see that all around us in Christianity? Most of the time it's just something that happens that is completely, we're completely oblivious to. That attitude of what are they doing here? The denomination idea in Christianity that's just infiltrated, it's just part of the fabric of modern Christianity has that same attitude of what are they doing here? Because we believe just a little bit different than somebody else. We act just a little bit different than somebody else. So we've got to isolate ourselves over here in our own little denomination, in our own little cocoon, and we just live within ourselves and we despise everybody that's not... We wouldn't say that. We wouldn't dare say that. But our actions completely condemn us by our attitudes, by our separation, by our uh, theological arrogance, by our being able to tell what the scriptures say and not accept someone else that might see things just a little bit different. It's still that same attitude. But we're just too proud to be honest about it sometimes. That's the whole thing. We read about these people here. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to a temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to him, this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, 
be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Which man pleased God? We've seen this perverted. We've seen this verse that, okay, I'm a sinner, just so I say I'm a sinner. They say the little sinner's prayer, and one of the part of it was, one of the part of it that you repeat after the minister is say that you're a sinner and have mercy on me. And we've just taken that and just completely made it mean nothing. But which man was justified here? The man who had it all laid out? Or the man who just said, here I am, Lord, just like I am. I don't believe this man went out and said, oh boy, now I'm forgiven. I can go live however I want to. But he, he was coming to the Lord. And he wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he was looking at heaven. And he was saying, be merciful to me, Lord. I am what I am. I'll do whatever you want me to do. The other man told him, boy, I'm glad I'm not like those people. I'm glad I'm not like those people over there. I'm glad I don't believe this or I don't believe that. And I'm glad we don't do those things. I'm glad our family don't do that. I'm glad our family doesn't do those things. Isn't it the same spirit? Isn't it the same thing? This one man encouraged himself in God. You know, a Pharisee has never seen himself. That's the problem. A Pharisee has never seen himself. Never really seen who he is. That's why he can have an exalted opinion about himself. That's why he can't look to God for mercy and help. Because he's never seen himself. He's never had to humble himself and just say, Lord, here am I. As worthless as I am, here I am. He's never been there. That's why he doesn't, that's why he can't forgive. That's why he can't extend mercy, because he's never known it himself. One of the best things that ever happened to me, I think, is me being able to sin and realizing that I was lost. You don't have to you don't have to just go out and sin to do that. You don't have to be a bad sinner to do that. But sometimes a Pharisee has to. A Pharisee sometimes has to be brought down so that he can look up. You know I was in a store this week and one of the cashiers was there and said uh, the man, there was a man talking to her about riding a motorcycle and kind of said, telling her to be careful because it was dangerous. And this girl was riding a motorcycle and he just kind of just told her to be careful and it kind of upset her. And she said, well, I've got to learn for myself. And I said to her, I said, you know, a wise man can learn from his mistakes. 
A wise man can make mistakes and learn from them. But I said even a wiser man can learn from somebody else's mistakes. They don't have to make those same mistakes. And they can learn from it. We can humble ourselves before the Lord. And that doesn't mean, you know, this false idea of humility. It's so sickening. See all these people that when you ask them to do something, they just, oh, I don't want to do that. Uh, it's just another form of pride. Not just to be what you are. Put on a big show about being humble. Put on a big show that you're going to listen to people, that you're going to... To truly be humble is to be humble before the Lord. And sometimes that's going to look pretty arrogant to other people. To truly be humble is just to bow yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to do what you want me to do irregardless of what anybody else thinks. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Whenever we, we read about Isaiah, he was a prophet going around preaching. And then one day, the Bible says that he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw the Lord. He was a prophet, respected prophet. And then one day, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He fell at his feet. He said, Lord, what can I say anymore? I, I don't even have anything to say. He saw the Lord. Sometimes whenever we're trying to perform, we look at ourselves, we're not seeing the Lord. We're not seeing the Lord. Sometimes when we perform well and we start getting proud of ourselves, we're not seeing the Lord. Our biggest problem of those who are honest, they see themselves and they criticize themselves and they think, what's the use? They give up, they want to quit, they, they want to get discouraged. You know, you can't fight a war discouraged. That's one of the problems I face a lot of times is just getting discouraged. What's the use? Wanting to give up. Just, you can't fight a strong battle when you're discouraged. It's impossible. In a war, the general tries to keep his troops encouraged so they'll fight. But when they're discouraged, they're just looking for a way to run and looking for a way to get out. When we're looking at the king, we can be encouraged. <clears throat> I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Another verse talks about the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. This is who God is exalting. This is who God is saying went down to his house justified. Whatever we make out of it, whatever we want it to make, want it to say, this is who God will exalt. Find our encouragement in the Lord. 
And they were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. Here even the disciples started rebuking people for coming to the Lord. I don't know whether it was just inconvenient, unhandy. I don't know what the problem was. But people were coming and bringing their children to the Lord. And the disciples stepped up and said, Get away. Get away. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. not enter it at all. What does it mean to receive the kingdom of God like a little child? Does it mean I can do it? I'll just take care of everything? I'll fix it all myself? No. To receive it as a little child is just to accept what God has for us and just do it. Look to Him. If you tell your child to do something, he doesn't know whether he can do it or not. Who does he ask help from? Who does he look to for guidance to do what you've asked him to do? He says, you, a little child says, Daddy, what, how do I do that? What, what do I need to do to do that? But he's willing to do it. And he looks to the Father for help, for guidance to do it. And the Father explains it to him, and then he goes and does it. Verse 18, it says, A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In Mark, it says, There was this rich young ruler. He came running up to Jesus and he knelt down and said, What must I do to be saved? This is after he's talked about the Pharisee and the man that smote his breast and then the children coming up and accepting it like a little child and then this man comes running up to Jesus and said what must I do to be saved what must I do to be saved and Jesus said to him why do you call me good no one is good except God alone No one is good except God alone. Look to God. Look to God. This is that encouragement. God is good. And although we have the choice of good and evil, although we have the opportunity to make that choice, don't think that you're good enough in yourself to do it. Then he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. He told him, basically, to love your neighbor as yourself. To love God with all your heart. He said, all things I have kept from my youth. I've done all this from my youth. I'm not like those others. I'm not like those Pharisees. Or I'm not like those swindlers and 
adulterers and unjust people. I'm not like those other people. That's what he said. I've done all of it. I've done it. And he said, all these things have I kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. There's one thing that he lacked. He had done all the rules. He had kept them all. He had done everything he was supposed to do. He was like the Pharisee. And Jesus said, there's one thing that you're lacking. You haven't humbled yourself like a little child and given yourself to God. There's one area in your life all the rest of it you've kept just fine. But there's one area in your life that you're holding on to yourself. I want that one. That's the one I want. The one that will humble yourself. The one that will cause you to trust the Lord. The one area in your life that you're not trusting in yourself anymore. You're not looking in yourself anymore. You're humbling yourself and trusting the Lord. You're finding your encouragement not in your performance, but in the Lord. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, The things that are impossible with people are possible with God. The things that are impossible with people possible with God. The performance that people are trusting in for people it won't work. It's impossible based solely on your performance to please God. That's where the humbling ourselves comes in. Lord, I can't do it my way. I can't do it my church's way. I can't do it my religion's way. I'm going to humble myself and do it your way. Finding our encouragement in the Lord is humbling ourselves before Him and saying, God, I'll do it your way, however you want it done. That's what the church is about. That's what being a part of the kingdom of God is about. So many people are trying to do it their own way. And they've done it all their own way. They've kept it all their own way. But there's never been that humbling. That part that has brought you to where you can't look down on anybody else anymore because you see yourself. You see that it's not you. And you're looking to the Lord. And that's what the Lord tried to bring out in this man. That wanted to be saved. That wanted eternal life. Give up. 
give up on yourself. Give up on your way. This has been perverted. Now I can just go do it however I like. That's not what Jesus was talking about. That's the very example that He's given here in this rich young ruler that came to Jesus wanting to be saved. He didn't just say believe that Jesus died for you. He didn't just say believe on the Lord. He said, I want your heart. I want everything about you. I want you to trust in me. That's what faith is. That's what trusting Him is. That's why it's so important that we find our encouragement in the Lord and not in ourselves. When we get discouraged, it's because we're looking in the wrong place. We're looking at ourselves. We're looking at them. We're looking at how we performed. How we didn't perform. We're looking at ourselves instead of just saying, Lord, here I am. I'll be what you want me to be. Coming to the Lord like a little child. We see ourselves too big. Instead of just coming to the Lord like a little child. Turn to Acts chapter 4. It's what Jesus was talking about when we come to the Lord with why it's hard for a rich man. And it's not just about how much money. A rich man is, has, is someone who has a lot of different uh, things at their fingertips. And it's not just about money. It's not just about the money. A rich man doesn't have to depend on anybody else. A rich man has all these resources at his fingertips and he doesn't need anybody else. This man who came to Jesus and said, I've got all these things. I've done all these things. He had resources within himself. He didn't need the Lord. He had all the resources within himself. And it's not just about dollar bills. He had religious resources. He had religious power that he had been given and Jesus said sell all of that and follow me give up your resources give up all he, he wasn't just talking about money he was talking about this power within himself that he could do it himself because he had the training he had the teaching he had all the things that he needed and Jesus said, sell all that. Paul said, I count all of that, but dumb. I count all of that, but manure. I count all of that, but trash, that I might gain the Lord. That's where our power is. That's where our resources need to be. Not in our Bible knowledge. Not in our upbringing. Not in any of that. Sell all of that. Give it away and follow the Lord. We see this here. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. The title is sharing among believers. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own but all things were common property to them. Here we have the example of physical things. But when we're one heart and one soul, 
everything belongs to one another. The, there's people that make up these uh, religions where they all pile all the resources together and they buy a big farm somewhere and they all live together in one little house. And some powerful man controls it all. And everybody just does their little part. And they say that's what this verse means. But that's not at all what it means. It's got to belong to you before it can be everybody's. It's something that you have control over that you can give to everybody when they need it. That you can count it. Like Once you give it all to somebody and then somebody else just controls it, you have no more, nothing else to give. You're not, you're not given anymore. You're not a part of it anymore. This is something that they counted whatever they had. Anybody else could come and have it. Because it was still theirs. They still had control over it. And a year later, somebody could come and need something. And it still counted like it was everybody else's. It wasn't something you gave away once and then now somebody else distributes it. It's every day somebody can come and say, hey, I need a little something. And we soon get, oh boy, I get tired of giving to him. I get tired of giving to him. Do you count it all as yours? Or do you count it as belonging to everybody. There's a heart in that. That's why we preach and teach that our hearts are humble to the Lord and so that the things that we possess are not our own. So that when a brother's in need, doesn't matter how many times he's in need, we still help him. We still help him. We still help him. And that's been the blessing. We don't preach about tithes and you got to give, you got to give because if you're humbled in your heart and you've given everything away, it all belongs to everybody else anyway. It all belongs to somebody else. It don't matter how much they take from me. We're not going to take anything out of this life anyway. What are we trying to save up? We've come to understand that. That it's not about what I'm going to wind up with whenever I die it's probably going to be that's going to be the shame of it that we've got a bunch piled up for when we die I think it was John Wesley one time he said if I die and I've got more than I don't know what the amount was if I've got more than a hundred dollars in my pocket count me a thief Because I didn't do something with it. I just was piling it up for myself. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the abundant grace was upon them all. They were looking at Jesus. They weren't counting what they had or what was in them or what they possessed, whether their religious power or their money. It wasn't, there wasn't it. They were looking at Jesus. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the process of the sales. They laid them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as they had need. Now, Joseph, a Levite of the Cy Cyprian. Cyprian birth who was also called Barnabas by the apostles which translated mean the son of encouragement the son of encouragement not discouragement he wasn't worried about what he had and we see that and who owned a tract of land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles feet he gave what he had. We see here he gave his land and he laid it at the apostles' feet. But it was what he had. His religious training. 
his religious knowledge. He laid it at the apostles' feet. That's why it was encouragement, because his encouragement wasn't in him and what he had and what he possessed. His encouragement was, I lay all that down. I humble myself. My, and my encouragement's in, and the power of what they were talking about was in the resurrection and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. His hope was in God. That's where his encouragement came from. Barnabas, completely opposite of the other man who went away sorrowful. I've got a lot to offer. I've got a lot of resources. But he went away sorrowful, discouraged. Barnabas, his name, encouragement. The son of encouragement. He lost it all. He gave it all. And he was encouraged. The other guy tried to hang on to something. He went away sorrowful. How do you win? You lose. How do you gain? You give it away. That which is first will be last. That which is last will be first. How do you find encouragement? You give away everything you got. You give away who you are, what you are, what you know, and you find your encouragement in the Lord. You lay it at the Lord's feet, the apostles' feet. How do you lose? You just try to hang on to something. You just try to hang on to it. Just try to hold on to something of me and what I am. What I know, my religion, my teaching, my understanding, I'll just hold on to that. You'll lose. The example here is in money. And that's a big problem. But the real example is in just not losing, not giving up. You know, people come by and they tell us, you're wasting your life. You're a loser. That's the only person that's going to gain anything. Is the guy that's lost it. And the more we lose, the more we give, and the more we find our encouragement simply in the Lord, that's the one that'll find it in the end. Over and over, this is the teachings of Jesus. You lose to gain. The guy that's trying to gain will lose it all. Whatever we try to hold on to will be lost. Write that down. Whatever you're trying to hold on to will be lost. And whatever you lose for his sake and the gospels will be found forever. Whatever you try to gain, whatever you try to keep, you'll lose it forever. This life, just a little while, your reputation, your holiness, whatever you're trying to hang on to, you'll lose it just as much as the rich man will lose every penny he's got by trying to gain it. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will he give in exchange? For his soul. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy.
we just offer ourselves this evening, this morning, Lord. We just offer ourselves to you, Father. Lord, and it's not about what we can offer. Even at that, Father, it's... We want to find our encouragement in you, Lord. Help us not try to hold on to anything, but to lay it all at the Master's feet. Again, we just thank you. In Jesus' name.